I'm really privileged to be here to speak in front of you, especially with um, the gentleman here to my left. Um, I work with them on a frequent basis, co-managing athletes in Houston, and I think this is a great representation of how an athlete should be managed, which generally includes a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, so I hope you gain a lot from this workshop. We're certainly going to talk about a number of things and fulfill the objectives for the workshop. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. We're going to also present one case, kind of a more complicated case, to show you um, the recovery pattern of a professional athlete. So some basics and background here. I guess first I wanted to mention uh, my background. I did a fellowship, a two-year fellowship in sports neuropsychology at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where I worked in the Department of Orthopedics under Freddie Fu and Mark Lovell. And now I am affiliated with UT Medical School in the Department of Orthopedics at um, UT and also director of the concussion program at Memorial Hermann. In addition to clinical practice, I do a lot of consulting work, um, particularly with the professional teams in town. And probably the, the most of my effort is spent, to, spent with high school athletes and amateur athletes and properly managing them following a concussion. Some work, workshop objectives here um, that we're going to talk about today is we're going to recognize the background information on concussion management. We're going to identify proper sideline clinic assessment um, tools. We're going to explain the utility of neuropsychological testing for pre-injury and post-injury assessment. We're going to receive information pertaining to the risk factors associated with concussion recovery. And we're going to discuss the role of medications in the management of concussion, uh, particularly with those with more complicated um, responses. Just some uh, background in terms of statistics. If you pick up any research article now in sports concussion management, you will see that the common figure that's listed is usually 300,000 sport, concu 300, sport concussions occur each year um, that do not result, or that do re result in a loss of consciousness. Um, and essentially what we believe though that is loss of consciousness really only accounts for a small percentage of of concussion. So if we only use the criteria that you have to lose consciousness to have a true concussion occur, then we would certainly miss a, a number of concussions that go on. So really the number is quite um, vast. We have 1.6 to 3.8 million sports-related concussions that occur each year. We probably have an underrepresentation of those, particularly because many of them go undiagnosed. Uh, let's talk about the definition of concussion. It's really important that you understand how to describe this to your athletes and your parents, and we really want to educate the medical community on what a concussion is. I think when many of you went to medical school, and even up to this date, many people still believe that a concussion is a brain contusion, or it's a um, the brain has um, had some sort of swelling. That's not necessarily true. We believe that the anatomy of the brain is often unaltered, um, although there are certain circumstances in which we have shearing and tearing of axons, which we may uh, signify a more significant concussion or then go into the category of traumatic brain injury. So what we really think happens here is really the brain injury, uh, the brain is in crisis. It's in crisis mode. So when a force happens and the brain shakes inside the skull like an egg yolk inside of an eggshell, um, the most sim simple way you can put it to someone, what happens is so many things are occurring where there's decreased blood flow, um, there's increased metabolism to restore this balance, there's insufficient glucose to power the brain, and the supply just isn't there to meet the brain's demand. So particularly when an athlete goes in and does some cognitive exertion or thinking, um, they will assume or they will experience a number of symptoms. So the same thing happens if you then return to the, the game and you start to um, increase your heart rate, increasing blood flow, and the brain cannot handle that. And so therefore the symptomatology occurs, which can be different for every person um, who experiences such a phenomenon. This can last for days to week, and we really don't know for sure exactly when that recovers and when it's safe to put someone back. That's still up for debate and certainly needs to be researched further. The topic of concern here for sports-related concussion, as you all um, are likely aware, you can't um, you know, not watch Sports Center, the NFL Network, or um, certainly pick up a newspaper where you don't see some effort um, related to the topic of sport concussion. Certainly you're um, hearing about NFL players suing now for maybe improper care when they played. Um, the guidelines have not always been data-driven. Uh, CTs and MRIs are insensitive. We'll talk about that a little bit further. 
Sport uh, self-report usually predicates return to play, and it still does in most cases. Not everyone's using neuropsychological testing or objective data in returning athletes to play. They're relying on what the athlete's telling us, which, you know, guess what? I'm going to lie, too, if I want to go back in and play and, and really do what I love to do. It's going to happen. It's, it's, it's very common. And there's a lot of variability. It still exists with physician recommendations. No people, no two persons are really treating recovery and management from concussion the same in many ways. So the long-term effects, of course, are out there. We're, we're starting to study them now. Are, they, are there long-term risks? Um, you know, when and how many concussions is too many? Uh, when should an athlete retire? And that's all very controversial. Some myths and facts. I um, put this in the slides because this is what I've, I've had over the years is what's been told to me. Um, and you've probably very well experienced them in your practices or on the sidelines and, and such that if you didn't get knocked out, you don't have a concussion. Another common one is the CT scan was okay and the ER doctor said I could return to play. I don't need anything else. Uh, the athlete's only complaining of a little lightheadedness. Uh, she just got her bell rung. Doc, she's, you know, coach, she's okay to return back to the game. And concussions only happen in contact sports like hockey and football. We all know that's not true as well. Uh, it's Thursday, my headache's mostly gone, and I will suit up and play in Friday's game. And the last um, one here, or the last two, is every athlete recovers from concussion at the same rate. It's usually about a week. You'll be fine after a couple days. And helmets prevent concussions. So guess what? The helmet manufacturers are now being sued as well by folks for maybe false advertisement and whatnot. So now I'm going to turn it over to my counterpart, Dr. Rand, who's going to talk with you about sideline evaluations. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott Rand. I, I am a primary care sports doctor with the Methodist Center of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine up at Willowbrook. I, I've done primary care sports in this area for about 11 years now, I, and I've been part of the Methodist organization and the Methodist Concussion Center for just about two years. I, I've worked a lot with Summer over the past, and uh, she is a great asset and probably one of the most knowledgeable people in, in the country on the management of concussion and the diagnosis. The complicated ones that I have and the people who just don't get better, I call her. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is what do you do first? Uh, there's a lot of controversy right now uh, about how do we treat long-term concussions and post-concussion syndrome, but honestly, the thing you guys are going to be most interested in is what are you going to do when the trainer brings the kid to you on the sidelines and says, Doc, I think he's got a concussion. What do you got to do? Okay? So on the field, you remember, just like your ATLS and your, your any other sideline evaluation course you've had, any athlete that is unable to get up on his own after a hit should be assumed to have a C-spine injury and evaluated as such. Remember your airway, breathing, circulation, and neurologic disability, and stabilize the neck first. When I talk to the residents about this, I say, I don't go up and stand over them and say, son, can you pick your head up? I, I get down next to them, hold their head still, and then I talk to them. So I really don't want them moving themselves until I'm confident that that's okay. So if they're laying there, before I talk to them, I'm at their head holding the helmet first. Okay? If you have any concern for spinal cord or head trauma, board them and transport them off the field, and then it's no longer your problem or a decision you've got to make anymore. Now, it can be kind of difficult. Uh, several studies a number of years ago said that at the end of every football game, well over two-thirds of the linemen come off with a headache. Two-thirds of the linemen don't have a concussion. Uh, so just having a headache by itself isn't enough of a diagnosis. So you don't need to worry about and say, oh, if you have a headache, then you're obviously concussed, you have to be out. We'd probably cease having football altogether if that were the case. The science can be kind of vague. It can be somebody who just isn't acting quite right, kind of looks at you, and you, know, you look at them, and you know they're really not looking back at you. But, and there are other problems that you can have that can, be, can look just like concussion. Remember, like we said, not every headache is a concussion, and not every concussion comes off of the headache. Uh, one of my colleagues last year for one of the Woodland schools uh, said she had a kid come off and did nothing but laugh the whole time he was on the sidelines. He just wasn't acting right, was wandering around and just laughing his head off. Didn't complain of a headache, didn't complain of anything else, but was obviously concussed. Okay? Uh, the other problem you run into is football is a hitting sport. Okay? The, the objective is to run into other people and you're going to get hurt. And if every time uh, you don't feel quite right, you come off and say, Coach, I'm not quite right, uh, that's something that those kids just aren't going to do. The, the, the coaches, the other players 
I aren't going to allow you to do it. And so changing the culture from it's okay to suck up this injury but not okay to suck up concussions is really tough to do. And it's something that you know, is going to take a long time. Uh, but as you'll hear over and over today, getting your bell rung is no longer a minor injury. That is no longer something to just ignore. Okay? The signs that you'll see, the <laughs> athlete will appear dazed or confused. They'll have that thousand yard stare. Uh, you ask them what their job is on this play, they'll answer very slowly or not have any idea. Uh, they'll be the athlete that goes the wrong way or lines up on the wrong side of the ball. Uh, they forget the plays, they forget what they're supposed to do. They're unsure of the game, the score, their opponent. They answer questions slowly and they come off and they say, well, are you okay? And they just look at you, look at you, say, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. You know that's really not the, ca the case. They can have behavior personality changes. More emotional than usual, can be completely flat, or they can be you know, laughing or crying inappropriately. And they can't recall events before or after the injury. That we think is probably the most significant symptom that they'll have that pretends a longer recovery. So if they come off and uh, they say, what happened? And you tell them, and you come back to them a couple minutes later and they say, what happened? And you tell them, and they come back a couple minutes later and they say, what happened? And you tell them, that's an injury that isn't going to get better very quickly in a lot of cases. Okay. Okay. The symptoms that they'll complain of would be headache. And it's typically not a, a, a tenderness in the head. It's not a my head feels tight or my helmet didn't fit quite right. It's a throbbing, pounding, migraineous kind of headache typically. Often they'll be nauseous, they'll have balance problems or dizziness, and that's what we're finding. You know, some of the college schools will use uh, just balance as a, a screening test to see are they well enough to go. The blurred vision, they can have light or noise sensitivity, much like a, a migraine headache. They can feel real sluggish. They'll complain of feeling foggy, like they're walking around in a fog and their brain doesn't work well. Uh, they can have concentration or memory troubles, and they can just be kind of confused. Okay? So if you, and this is the law, if you or someone on the team suspects that an athlete's concussed, they have to be removed from play, but that doesn't mean that they're done. If you're worried about it, you've got to check. But if you can confidently say, nope, that's not a concussion, they get to go back in. Okay? But you have to pull them off or look. If their parent, if a coach, if a referee, if somebody says, I'm worried about him being concussed, they get evaluated. Okay? You evaluate for concussion symptoms and you test memory and cognitive function. We'll talk about that in just a little bit here. Okay? There are a lot of tools that you can use to evaluate, assist in the evaluation of a concussion on the sideline. There's what are called the modified Maddox questions. That's what game are we in, what quarter is it, What's, who scored last, what's the score, and who did we play last week? Those simple questions have been used over and over, um, but just orientation questions like what day is it today, where are we at, that, and what time is it by themselves aren't that valid, quite valid to use. There's the sideline assessment of concussion, that's the SAC test. That tests memory, concentration, and orientation. All these are available on numerous websites and maybe part of the handout that you have. Uh, the SCAT test adds a symptom list. The SCAT 2 test adds balance and coordination. It asks them, asks them to stand on one foot, stand with one foot in front of the other, stand and do a Romberg test. Uh, that's really not useful. To go through a SCAT 2 by itself actually takes about 15 minutes. They're not going to tolerate it, and the head coach isn't going to tolerate you spending 15 minutes on the sidelines of a football field deciding whether or not somebody's concussed. It's often a very quick, simple thing, and in a lot of cases, it's obvious. And when they come off the case, often they just can't answer your questions, they're, they can't stand on their feet, they're complaining of a horrible headache, uh, their, their reaction time is very slow, it becomes obvious that they're done. Okay? And it's not the case where if they look bad, you sit them down for 15 minutes, and if they clear, they get to go back in. That is not the case anymore. Okay, okay. so the reality of the sideline evaluation is there's no gold standard for diagnosis. That an athlete can pass all the questions and still be concussed. There's no absolute way to know for sure, and it comes down to, quite honestly, your clinical judgment. But the most sensitive indicator of somebody, of an athlete being concussed, is him being honest enough to say, wow, I'm not right. I had an athlete in spring a couple of years ago that I had a kind of a difficult conversation with the coach, and he got hit as a wide receiver, came off, didn't know where he was, didn't know anything, was obviously concussed, and we sat him down a little bit, and uh, I went over and talked to the coach, and, or talked to the trainer, talked to the coach, and said, he's done for the day. Uh, the coach went over and talked to him, and he comes over and says, he's always like that, come on. Yeah, he's not always like that, okay? 
your clinical judgment's necessary, and remember, your job is to be there to protect the athlete. Uh, you're, it's much easier to pull them out of that game, let them uh, recover quickly and be back hopefully in a week or two, rather than go in, uh, miss that, go in, get hit several more times, get a more significant injury that keeps them out the entire season. And that's the discussion that I'll often have with them. You're better to sit now and get well quickly uh, because you know they don't want to they don't want to tell their coach, they don't want to tell their teammates that they're hurt because they don't look hurt. It's very hard for somebody, especially the culture of football, or actually a lot of other sports, soccer, anything, where they come in, they don't look bad, but their brain doesn't work. And it's very hard for them to stand, be athlete enough to say, no, I'm not ready yet. So that's kind of what we're for. Okay, so when you make the diagnosis of a concussion, that athlete is done for the day. Okay, by law, it's no longer a decision if you're... If they're concussed, they're concussed, and they're done for the day. I don't care if they're better in 10 minutes. I don't care if they're coming in the second half saying, I'm fine, I can go back in. They are done for the day. Okay? You get, if you make that call, you sit them on the sidelines and you watch. You go back and talk to them. When I see somebody on the sidelines of any game that I called, I say has been concussed, you take their helmet away, you sit them down, and I go back and talk to them every 10 or 15 minutes. And you watch for signs of neurologic deterioration. Okay? Hide his helmet and tell the coach he's done. Okay? The signs of deterioration you look for are worsening headache, seizures, kind of a no-brainer, focal neurologic deficits. If they start saying, well, my arm is getting weaker, I can't pick myself up, my legs won't work. Altered level of consciousness, they're getting more and more drowsy. Uh, often is not an unusual thing with concussion, but it's one of those signs that you pay attention to and say, okay, you don't get to go home tonight before you go get checked at the ER. Okay? Repetitive vomiting, what I tell them is you get to throw up once. If you throw up more than once, you get to go to the emergency room. Okay? Slurred speech, increase in confusion, increase in irritability. Okay? Things that, that send the ambulance there, loss of consciousness for greater than 30 seconds. Okay? Weakness or numbness in the arms and the legs, of course, you worry more about cervical spine issues with that. Rapidly deteriorating level of consciousness, we all remember uh, the, the lucent period of the epidural hematoma, uh, that uh, they're fine and then all of a sudden they collapse and die. Unequal pupils uh, and... To, Truly the only reason on the pre-participation physical we look at pupils is to see are they unequal to begin with. So if you see that they're unequal then, you know that it was that way before, and if they have a seizure. Okay, so in summary, there's no longer the ability to say, I ah, just got his bell rung, he'll be okay, he can go back in. Okay, the diagnosis of concussion on, on the sidelines can be difficult, but in reality, the vast majority of the time, it's pretty obvious. Okay, remember to check athletes frequently once you've decided they're concussed. Go back and check on them every few minutes to make sure there's no deterioration and there's no return to play the same day. So how does um, neuropsych assessment, how did it find its way into sports? Well, in 1984, Jeffrey Barth, he's a pretty famous neuropsychologist, really kind of instigated neuropsych testing at the University of Virginia. And he did paper pencil testing, so that naturally is time consuming. And most coaches that I know wouldn't tolerate me to bring an athlete in and do eight hours of testing, nor would I put the athlete who's grossly symptomatic from a concussion through that. But that's sort of what was going on at the time to find out um, what were the deficits someone was experiencing pre and post concussion. Then Mark Lovell, he's a, my mentor, uh, spearheaded the Pittsburgh Sports Concussion Program where he started looking at, you know, baselines are really important so we have something about someone to compare them to afterward. And he used um, many of the standard neuropsych tests that are listed there below and we called it the Steeler Battery and I still utilize those tests in part of my practice. So if someone's not looking good on uh, neuropsych testing that's computer based then we might supplement them with these tests. In the late 1990s, that's when computerized assessment evolved due to time constraints and certainly wanted to have more pre-assessment um, efficiency and, and pre-assessment. And the most widely computerized measures at this time include um, IMPACT, which we're going to go over more specifically. It stands for Immediate Post-Concussion Assessment um, and Neuropsychological Assessment. And the automated neuropsychological assessment matrix is um, ANAM, so that you might have heard of um, utilized with the military. So that's what we use in theater for the military pre and post injury. The COG sport and the headminder also have um, some, some studies backing them. And then recently, CNS Vital Signs, if you go to some sport uh, medicine conferences, they've been sort of uh, really pushing their product. At this point, there's not a lot of uh, documentation or studies with them. So most widely, though, studied and most validated has been impact across the board. 
So Dr. Rand did mention um, some of the sideline tools that we use or maybe some of the brief screening tools that you could utilize if you didn't have access to impact. So something is certainly better than nothing. And overall, this has been um, somewhat criticized, though, in terms of its sensitiv sensitivity in picking up on concussion. So if someone really bombs a SCAT too, um, then you really know there's a serious thing going on here because most people can kind of get through most of the components of the SCAT. And what it's composed of is like he mentioned, the um, SAC, which is your orientation. You remember um, when you give your athletes, you know, say the digits backwards, they always recall that. I, I did pretty good until I had to do those digits backwards and I can't remember anything then. So that's part of that assessment. And now we have various forms of the SCAT too. So the NHL has its own version, the NFL, and we utilize those where the idea is we take the athlete, remove them from the sideline, generally in the locker room, con conduct that assessment, and therefore there's the documentation going through the whole um, trajectory. Now I would also recommend if your school or your, your uh, club or team is utilizing the SCAT two or the athletic trainers that you work with, it's nice to have baseline tests as well because again we're, we're assessing someone who may not be great at remembering the months of the year ordinarily um, in backwards uh, order. So it's important to have baselines as well on those instruments. Now um, for the NHL, the protocol is pretty specific. I'm going to go through some of the protocols for professional sports and the reason for that is I want to kind of drive the point that we have a lot of sophistication now with our professional sports and the, and the protocols that we utilize and, and the idea is it needs to trickle down to our high school athletes and our middle school athletes whom are really the most vulnerable for concussion. In the NHL, we baseline test everyone um, at the start of the season. Their baseline generally can follow them throughout their, level, their, their time in the league for the most part. Um, it has to be supervised by a neuropsychologist. The players removed immediately if symptoms are reported or they ex exhibit any observable signs. They're evaluated on the SCAT 2, like I mentioned before. Referred to a neuropsychologist for a cognitive assessment that includes impact, which is the computerized assessment we're going to talk about, as well as paper pencil testing. And um, we have a gradual return back to activity. So it's pretty specific and the tests are identified as to what we need to utilize. The NFL established their program generally in 1994 at the tail end of um, folks coming forward like Al Toon and Merrill Hosh, you know, complaining of some long-standing cognitive issues. Now certainly, I alluded to before, there's a lawsuit involved in which many people or players are coming forward and questioning their level of care that they received. Um, in 2007, this is the first kind of real push and this is where we were um, instructed to mandate neuropsych testing. However, the tests like with the NHL, the tests are not identified. So really the medical staff can choose what neuropsych tests they want to utilize. In 2009, the NFL adopted even stricter policies in which um, the team had to um, put the athlete through an evaluation with the team physicians, but also an outside neurologist or neurosurgeon, a consultant. And all of the members um, that had concussions would then also go through neuropsychological testing and look at their pre and post injury scores. Major League Soccer also has a pretty strict protocol. It's pretty similar to the NHL protocol in which um, baseline testing supervised by a neuropsychologist as well as post-injury assessment. Uh, athletes in this uh, league also have to do the paper pencil testing and we have to track progress pretty specifically with the SCAT two each day. So Theron will go over his case later with you with the Major League Soccer player and he will indicate to you how he had to each day give this person the SCAT. Major League Baseball also has a protocol in which uh, not only specific to players but also umpires. Uh, many umpires were getting concussions and many of them were having some long-standing effects because we were putting them back in their position and they weren't necessarily um, healed. So 10 Major League Baseball players or teams, excuse me, started baseline testing in the 2006 season. In February of 2011, they had a more definitive criteria which also mandated neuropsych testing for base uh, for um, the players as well as the umpires. We have on-field SCAT 2s. We also um, have recommended here that there is an outside consultant that be part of this and team physician can clear athletes with the approval from a um, Major League Baseball medical director. So why bother with cognitive testing? Um, I think this is always, many of you have heard me speak before, I always use this um, cartoon because this is what it's like working with a 
athlete many times, but it's also what it's like working with a teenager. Um, you never know if they're happy, sad, depressed, you know, what's going on. They kind of give you the same fine every single day. But I'll also go a step further and tell you that, you know, think about you could feel so horribly and you're walking down the hall and your colleague says, hey, how you doing? And you're like, fine, even though you really want to say, you know, possibly, you know, horrible, I have a headache and all of these things. It's acceptable just to say fine. So if we only say, hey, you got a headache, or how you doing, and they say fine, we just can't rely on that anymore. But yeah, this is the teenagers I work with, so I don't know if you can relate. Um, the utility of neuropsychological testing, we believe it provides objective evidence for someone in terms of their strengths and weaknesses. We also feel like it can identify things if the person isn't right. So maybe they are symptom free, but we are still having some functional changes in the brain. It's helpful in returning athletes safely to play, and it's a means to track athletes over time. So the unfortunate thing for these um, NFL athletes going through litigation might very well be that there hasn't been a standard approach to testing them over time, so we don't know what maybe their cognition was to begin with. That's gonna be an argument someone's gonna throw out in a lot of these hearings. Here's a timeline that I think is really important to follow. Preseason, we'd like to have um, neuropsych testing baselines conducted. Um, you don't have to do this every single year for your athletes, but what we do recommend is every level of play. So you might get that in middle school, again in junior high, high school, college pro, so each level of play. Um, if an injury occurs, we talked about the sideline assessment here, and ideally neuropsych testing should be conducted within one to two days of the incident. Now, if someone's grossly symptomatic, the worst thing you can do is put them on impact or give them any other neuropsych testing the day of their injury or even possibly the next day because we're going to talk about mental exertion in some ways can really blow up concussion symptoms and make them even more intense. So I often wait a couple of days to kind of let the symptoms settle down a bit before I do that. Um, and then we, we certainly determine return to play based on several things, not just neuropsych testing. That's one tool in our tool belt. It's certainly self-report, and it's certainly um, working with a team of folks to put someone back to play safely. Impact, um, the developers, Mark Lovell, Mickey Collins, and Joe Maroon, and Impact, uh, how many of you in here, your schools use it, or maybe you use it and interpret the data? Can, can I just kind of get an idea? So this test here um, is computerized. It takes about 30 minutes to administer. It's a nice test. I, I always tell athletes, like giving your brain a physical, because we get to look at your speed, your reaction time, your uh, verbal memory, visual memory, attention, all of those domains that we're looking at. After the athlete takes the test, we're able to get a report or a summary of their scores. And ideally, you need to be trained on utilizing this instrument and, and have some background in these things. It's, it's not just as easy as looking at things going up and down. I can tell you that for sure. But here's just some stimuli. Um, there's words on the test that one has to recall. They're presented with them on a couple of occasions, two trials, and then the idea is they recall them at the end of the test. Here's some of the fun squiggly lines everyone complains about. They're, they're very difficult. This component, um, I'm sorry things are flipping through. I haven't been able to fix this part of my presentation yet. But um, what we have is stimuli pop up on the screen and we hit corresponding keys to see how someone responds to stimuli, how quickly are they doing those things. And this is called the X's and O's task, where if you think back to memory, the memory game, um, there are three stimuli highlighted here. The athlete has to do another task and come back and recall where they were. So a lot of attention involved there. And this is merely a matching where they match the symbol. And then at one point, they will go away in terms of the numbers, and they have to remember what went with what. So it's a very challenging test if you've ever taken it. It's super hard. But the reason why it's, it's good is because it really picks up on cognitive issues one might be experiencing after concussion uh, that otherwise they may be going through school and doing quite well with. So some short-term effects here are that most athletes really generally do recover from concussion within a month, most of them. Age-related responses certainly occur after concussive injuries. So um, whenever a kid comes in and says, um, you know, hey, Ben Roethlisberger got to play next week, well, in many, and they're a high school kid, well, in many ways, having worked with an NFL team, the um, cognitive functioning of a professional athlete, we have research studies to support this, generally returns much more quickly to baseline than a high school athlete or an, even a younger tyke. So there is some changes there that may be related to developmental things, which we'll get into. Um, and a history of multiple concussions may lengthen the cognitive recovery period. So when you start seeing kids, particularly have had a couple of concussive events in the same football season or same soccer season, you're going to see their cognitive uh, functioning takes longer to re return to normal or return back to baseline. 
Here's a illustration here of the, the type of athlete who comes to you and says, maybe they had their injury on Friday night and they come to you on Saturday and they say, I feel good. I really, doc, I have no headache, I feel good. And you really believe them. Maybe the incident was fairly mild at the time. You were even questioning whether they had a concussion. This is an illustration here of within four days after a concussion, even folks that were claiming they were asymptomatic were still under the, on their baseline when compared to a control group. So they still were showing deficits when compared to their own baseline, even when they said they were fine within four days. So that's important information because even though that they may be symptom free, if their cognition has not returned to normal, it still may suggest that they're highly vulnerable to a second impact syndrome or another um, you know, a chronic set of symptoms. That's also true here with reaction time and processing speed. Those domains as well are also under their baseline for those athletes that are four days um, or that are asymptomatic within four days. Here's a real life example. I got a phone call. Hey, you know, I think this kid got a concussion in practice. We're uncertain. It seems like his symptoms resolved fairly quickly. Um, he's doing well. He's at school today. He's not complaining of any symptoms. Is this somebody we really need to refer? And I said, absolutely. This is the person you really want. This is probably the number one person you want to um, refer because, yes, you do believe them, but is it really true that they're, they're fine or maybe they are minimizing? So what this shows is here's an athlete with a baseline. Um, I'm not sure if you all had handouts. I hope you do. But um, this is kind of small. But you can see on the second set of scores there on post-injury one, those are in red to illustrate that there's a statistically significant change from their baseline. Okay, So not just a small change, but enough that it's just something happened to them. So that's concerning. So what we did, though, because they were symptom-free, reporting that they were symptom-free, we did allow them to start exercising according to the return to play protocol, but you would not just put somebody back into practice that day and dismiss that a concussion ever occurred. Um, and then by, let's see, we tested them five days later, had started exerting, was saying, I'm symptom-free, doc, I have no problems. And by that point, everything is back to baseline, if not better. So that's really encouraging. That's where this is important. Here's a clinical report that illustrates the importance of baseline testing. I would say 75% of athletes that I see in my clinic don't have baseline tests. It's getting better. It's certainly in the seven years I've been doing this, I'm seeing more and more baselines, which is encouraging. Um, and this is where experience with knowing, kind of like a radiologist does, well, what's normal age-related changes in the brain um, for someone? It's the same thing here. It's, it's knowing what's, what's normal and not normal, even age, age ranges. So here's a, a post-injury test, and we ended up following them up about seven days uh, post on the post-injury two. And it, even at post-injury two, I thought, gosh, you know, according to what they're reporting to me academically, they were all in the average range, their scores. He had a superior um, 92nd percentile reaction time, symptom-free, had went through all of our, our steps. And um, what I did was, because you've never had a baseline, once you're back into play, you know, a couple weeks, why don't you go ahead and get a baseline, though, moving forward? And, and this illustrates, look at how much better that baseline even is from the post-injury two test. So that may indicate that, you know, without a baseline, sometimes we're kind of maybe rushing people back. So it's important to have this. We can see his true performance is really those third set of scores. And I will also mention that many times it's, it's good to get a baseline after concussions occurred because um, the baseline with which you return them back to sport is often um, representative of true effort. They probably give them the best effort they can give to be able to go back to play. Um, bell ringer. So we still use that uh, term even though a lot of people have slapped our hands because the, they indicate that we're maybe minimizing the true effect of concussion. Um, we still use it because sometimes there is those, those um, incidences on the sideline when you've worked and you're like, I, I just don't know if it's the kid's normal headache or if it's really concussion. But nevertheless, we want to talk about um, these quote unquote bell ringers and kind of how they, they look in, in sport concussion. So there was a study conducted with 64 high school athletes where we looked at athletes who'd had less than five minutes of, of symptoms and those with five to 15 minutes of symptoms. So with the um, American Academy of Neurology guidelines, if, you don't if your symptoms resolve within the five to 15 minutes, generally it was supported that you could go back in and play, that you were okay, you, you didn't have a severe concussion. Um, but none of these athletes were returned to play, um, and we did look at them serial, um, in serial progression afterward from their baseline to day two, day four, and day seven to kind of see what they look like on neuropsych testing. So we broke them up into groups, and what you can see here is even the group with less than five minutes of symptoms, 
is still, if you look at that first 36 hours, is still below their own baseline at 36 hours. Um, they, they do recover more quickly with a, a less presentation of symptoms or a, a less duration of symptoms. They do get better more quickly on cognitive assessment, but even by day seven, the group with five to 15 minutes of symptoms are still below their baseline on in this particular sample. So again, that illustrates that if you would go ahead and put someone back in perhaps with just some questionable symptoms, they may cognitively, now I'm not talking about symptoms, but cognitively still be um, impaired. So um, in that baseline, you can see that there's a little bit of difference too in their baseline scores, but that wasn't sign significant. And this is the same with symptoms, um, you, you know, even 36 hours later, uh, symptoms in terms of that, they're still complaining of, of some symptoms and they're also different. By day seven, they're generally the same. So it's very interesting as well. Recovery from concussion, um, is, there an, is there an age relationship here? And when we looked at professional athletes and we looked at high school athletes within two and three days of their concussion, you can see that High school athletes in blue are almost one standard deviation below their performance um, when compared to professional athletes. And that's in, in all domains generally, and particularly reaction time is the most affected as well as verbal memory. So there is some indication that cognitively um, professional athletes may return to their baselines more quickly. Of course, you know, you will throw out there, well, what about sandbagging when they, if they have them so low, maybe they're not having to reach very far. And um, so hopefully what's happening now in all of the different arenas is those baselines are being looked at very carefully for those types of issues. Um, this is the same thing here with um, just looking at them five and seven days. So it takes um, a professional athlete about five days to return back to their baseline and about seven for high school on this cognitive measure. Again, this is a, a sample. Um, does gender matter? We're starting to get more uh, studies looking at gender. Um, you know, folks really think that concussions really happen in, in hockey and football, and I don't know if you all have been seeing soccer girls, but that's pretty pronounced, and many of them are having really significant concussions that are disrupting their lives, and they're out of school, they're on medication now, and we have some pretty, the, between the four of us, we have a lot of those cases going on with females, and it's tough. So we're looking at gender, and um, I always say, you know, that um, men think women are so complicated and, you know, they just can't understand us, but really we're probably the more smarter sex so that we've got, you know, a lot more things going on in our brain. So it takes us longer to recover, to restore all that stuff. So if you buy my hypothesis, then that's great. But um, either way, us girls take longer to recover on impact than our male counterparts. Um, the argument to that, though, also, is that at our baseline, we like to tell you all about our problems. So we're going to also let you know at our baseline that we have lots of symptoms. So the argument, counter-argument to that might be that it's maybe more acceptable in society for females to complain about things and not males, or maybe females, um, you know, afterward also indicate are more honest on testing. So either way, um, within five days, women certainly are showing a more significant change on baseline, almost close to half a standard deviation away from, um, from their male uh, counterparts. But also, um, what I would illustrate here is that we're controlling for sport, and in sports like soccer and basketball, where we can control for those things, girls are also suffering more concussions. The incidence is higher, perhaps neck strength, there's you know, a bunch of other hormonal changes, there's a bunch of um, hypothesis in that respect. Long-term effects, um, research has produced mixed results. Um, whenever I was a fellow, a very controversial um, project came out with the NFL that showed that there were no long-standing results, and, and now, um, you know, everyone's complaining that there are. So, you know, what's really accurate here? Is there really things going on that we're missing? A majority of the research so far has really been conducted with um, boxers as well as football players and, and historically men. And once concussed, though, there is a statistic out there by Gus Gwitz, um, pretty um, famous athletic trainer who does a lot of concussion research and, and a lot of presentations. And he's indicating that you may be four to six more uh, times more likely to have a future concussion. So what I would clarify, though, is because when, when parents ask you, well, now that my son's had a concussion or my daughter, are they at more risk to having a subsequent concussion? Yes, for sure, if they are not recovered from the first one. But I've seen it clinically that most of the time when these things are followed properly, the, the, the stuff that we've talked about and the management strategies, many times their risk may be no greater than if they didn't have one before. So it's the key is the management style here and how one gets back to play safely. 
Um, these are just indicating here that there are some significant differences. They're really for your um, own resources if you ever want to look these things up. I just put some illustrations. I won't go through all of them. But there are studies to indicate that there are some long-term effects, particularly in people that have had multiple concussions. And this is more of the high school population. So again, that developing brain may be playing a role here. Um, these particular um, projects said that there were no statistical differences um, when looking at athletes with multiple concussions. So that's, you know, again, other information here to produce a contradictory response to that. And um, one of the things that's very controversial as well is, is using computerized testing more sensitive than using paper pencil assessment. And um, hopefully you're all not concerned with that. You have someone that's doing those kinds of things for you. But um, what we did look at is really when comparing those things, we're not seeing that one test is more superior th than the other. However, um, are we, you know, as far as why are these um, mixed findings occurring? Well, we have people, there's no set standard tests that are occurring, no set protocol. Many people are getting different tests. and and they're just not the same tests that we're utilizing to, to do research on. Um, some of the things for why the, the data may be mixed is that a lot of times we're not looking at people in terms of their spacing of concussion. We're relying on them reporting to us. Um, when I take a history of an NFL player recently, he said, well, I think I might have had like three or four in college, maybe two in high school, and then another three or four in the NFL, but really can't give me any information. It's never been documented. So we're doing research on things that really aren't documented, and we don't know for sure all this, the situations um, surrounding the incident. And we also rely heavily on self-report in terms of when someone's recovered. If you also do a question about your athlete and ask them about their previous concussions, they almost always say to you, well, the first concussion, I think I had a headache for like a day or so. Um, usually their um, recollection of the event and how they felt is pretty skewed. So um, those are just some things that we believe might also result in those mixed findings. Um, so cognitive rest and recovery, I um, want to just address this very quickly. Um, it's really important people get academic accommodations um, in, in the high school arena and the middle school and elementary folks after concussion. Cognitive work, we believe, of course, increases neuronal functioning, um, increases our demands for oxygen and glucose, and then it really exacerbates um, problems. So the athlete that comes to you on Saturday and says, I feel great, and you're ready to start getting them going on the return to play protocol, you probably want to wait till Monday. Because once they get to, to Monday and they get to school and they start doing things, you almost always get a phone call because everything's blown up and gotten worse. So it's important to use school days kind of as your barometer that they make it through them without any symptoms. And if you keep beating them up with all kinds of mental tasks, it's kind of a tough place to be in because they're in school and they have a concussion. Um, and this can really halt recovery. Um, but the more we throw at them, I've seen schools that don't really take it seriously, may not um, provide academic accommodations. Those kids really do take longer to recover from their concussion. So rest is very important. And we've also asked people, though, on the flip side of that, um, my colleague and I at U of H, we did a study and we're getting ready to put those together for publication, but we asked parents and athletes about if your school gave you accommodations, did you take advantage? And almost 75% of the pool of subjects that we had said they didn't take advantage of those accommodations. So um, we explored that further and a lot of what's going on is stigma. They don't want to be labeled as they're in special needs classes if they are in a, some kind of formal um, academic program. Um, maybe they're embarrassed. They don't want their schoolmates to know they have a concussion because many times you know, I have an athlete I'm working with now, they call him the concussion boy. So that's really frustrating and, and difficult. So many of them won't take advantage, or maybe they're just really, in some schools, there's a lot of overachievers. They don't want to take time to take a break. It, it may then, you know, mean that they're not going to get ahead or get done. So it's important stuff to look at. Um, accommodations uh, are really important, as I just indicated, and some of those things that we say are certainly like may, if their scores look poor, they may need to not take um, tests that week. We'll comment on that. Um, we may say they need to sit in the front of the room if there's a lot of distractibility and attentional things going on. We may also suggest they get pre-printed class notes because um, athletes will say, gosh, looking at that smart board or the, the PowerPoint's really bothering me. Um, and so it's important that they have something that they can maybe refer to later and not have to do that so much. Um, then the limiting video games, texting, phone stuff, that's super fun. Um, you know, we have to sever their lifeline for a couple of days in order for them to get better. But it's really important to address those things because kids are often on their phone, as you know, and maybe even sleeping with their phone in their room at night, not getting adequate sleep to recover. So that has to be addressed. You can't leave it out. And certainly driving in our young student athletes. If there's impaired reaction time, you really need to uh, comment on that after the testing. 
So we are going to, again, shift gears. We're gonna talk about um, proper return to play more on the exertional side of things. You got to hear all about the mental stuff and now we'll do the exertional component and how to work that through in the process. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about return to play now and to how to manage these concussions initially. And I see probably in the last year, close to 200 concussions. Uh, and I've kind of developed sort of a little spiel that I use for you know, the parents and the athletes to try to get them to understand what's going on and why this is kind of a big deal. So it, for the initial uh, talk I have is, you know, I tell them, you've got to rest your brain. Uh, like uh, Dr. Ott was saying in the first part, there's a problem with blood flow in the brain and I don't go into all the glucose and stuff like that. I just say, your brain's plumbing is messed up. So things that push more blood to your brain, like exercise, or things that make your brain require more blood, like video games and texting and homework uh, and arguing with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, are all things that are going to make you symptomatic longer. So if you want to continue to feel like this, keep doing those things. If you want to get better, go to your room. Okay? All right. Right now, there are 33 states, I believe, last count, that have mandated laws on concussions. Uh, the first one was Washington, and that was only two years ago. Uh, and since then, 32 other states have adopted state laws for concussion management. Uh, your return to play can begin when their symptoms have all resolved and they've returned to normal cognitive functioning. In Texas, the athlete has to be seen and released by a physician before they begin that. And they've got to have a physician sign off and say they're okay to begin their return to play protocol. That doesn't mean that they're okay to go out and play that day. They're okay to begin the return to play protocol that the school district has decided. Okay? And we'll talk a lot more about Natasha's law at the end of this today. Uh, there's 24 hours between stages, and by state law in Texas, there are at least five stages. Okay? If their symptoms recur, they have to go back to the previous asymptomatic stage, and quite honestly, most of my athletes, if they recur in their symptoms, I just set them down and go back to zero. Okay? Day one activity, there's cognitive and physical rest. What the, this is, from the time you get concussed, you're at day one, okay? Uh, until there's, their symptoms are gone. And I give them notes, like Dr. Ott was talking about, limit your homework, don't take tests. Making you take a test right now is measuring, like measuring your speed uh, or measuring your strength with your arm broken. Your brain's broke right now, and until it gets better, it doesn't make any sense to test how well it works, okay? Limit video games, texting, and any unnecessary physical work, okay? Day two is light aerobic exercise, things like stationary bike for 10 or 15 minutes. Jog a little bit. Usually no more than 15 or 20 minutes of total exercise on day two activity. And very light stuff, nothing that really makes them break a sweat, uh, nothing more exertional than walking up the stairs. Okay. Day three can be more sports specific, moderate intensity stuff, again a limited time frame, usually no more than about 20 minutes. No heavy weights, no extreme exertion, nothing that makes you hold your breath while you're lifting it, okay? and no contact. Okay. Day four can be heavy non-contact stuff, they're the kid that is in jerseys uh, that identify them as somebody you don't touch. Okay, okay for heavy weights and full time practice. Okay. They can go the entire day, they just can't do, do um, uh, any contact. Day five is a full contact practice, and this only occurs after they contact the doctor and say, are they cleared? And the doctor has to say yes, if they've completed those, these other days of the return to play protocol, they can be cleared. And there's some ways that we can get around that and make that a more efficient thing for you that you know, we'll kind of show you what to do at the end here. Okay? This, that, that return can be granted automatically, uh, but again, you got to take responsibility for saying, yeah, they're okay to go back to contact. So, it's to be, you've got to get cleared to return, begin the return to play protocol, and you have to have a second clearance from a doctor to return to contact. Okay? Day, day six is full release. Okay? And by that time, it's expect, expected that their, return to, their recurrence of injury is back at their baseline. And when we get to the end of this, we'll talk about why some people's baselines risk for injury may be a little bit different. Okay? Okay, each day they have to evaluate their symptoms. And what I have my athletic trainers do at schools is I give them the list of s symptoms that are on the impact test, or most of them anyway, and say, during school today or during the amount of return to play activity that you had, did you get a worsening of any of these symptoms? And I make them say answer yes or no for any, any of those. And if they get a worsening of their symptoms, they set back down. Okay. Okay, that's a brief thing on return to play, and we'll talk more about Natasha's law at the end here. Now, Dr. Braunreiter is going to talk about medicines that you can use. 
Good afternoon. I'm Dave Brownrider. I'm another primary care sports med doc. I'm down in Sugarland. I work with the Houston Dynamo as their medical physician. I'm with the Major League Soccer Concussion Protocol Committee that devised their, their plan of attack for dealing with this injury. And um, I've done a lot of work with the NFL and NCAA in that over, the, over the years. I want to thank my colleagues for giving me the vaguest topic to talk about because this one's really tough. There isn't a lot of research on it. There's a lot of feel with it. So um, getting into the meat, I like to start with a little bit of humor and wake everybody up. This is my favorite cartoon in the bleachers. If you have never seen it before, you should look at it. There are a lot of great sports med cartoons in that guy's uh, repertoire. Um, in the acute management, we've gone over a lot of that um, with what we do. Um, the main medication for or medical management for concussion in the acute phase is rest. It's the best medicine you can give. Um, most, of, most of these injuries are mild. It's called mild traumatic brain injury or MTBI um, because the impairments aren't that profound. Um, and they will resolve spontaneously within the first seven to 10 days on the average. Uh, so you don't really want to start throwing a bunch of medications around for long-term management for something that might resolve on its own. You can use analgesics, um, they're appropriate. I have a couple of caveats that I use at, uh, you know, in, my own, in my own practice, and I think it's echoed by a lot of my colleagues, is uh, you know, any type of anti-inflammatory or like acetaminophen is, is fair game once you've assessed that you don't have a bleed. But you always watch, I tell the kids and the parents or the adult that's injured, if you're doing something that creates a headache, that's a better medicine to avoid the trigger than it is to take a pill for it. Now, headaches will come and go from time to time, but with the injury until it resolves, but why would you want to keep poking at the sore point and, and take medicine for it? The other thing that may happen with that is you may actually um, trigger some headache, headache problems by overusing analgesic medications. I'll get into that a little bit later again. Um, narcotic use is frequently part of the emergency room physician prescription plan for most people coming in and out. You have some pain, you get Vicodin or Norco or something. And with this type of an injury, I'm, I'm very leery of using narcotics, mainly because I don't know if the, any type of goofy mental status coming from a narcotic is something to be worried about as a, a brain injury problem. So I, I usually say stay away unless you really know for sure and you're, you're comfortable with that and you're comfortable with the family Try to stay away from the narcotics if you can. Muscle relaxers, again, same kind of concept as the narcotics. Not quite as sedating, but they can be sedating. And um, they can help, particularly those who have the, the fall on the, on the head and neck and get the neck or the back strain um, along with this. Uh, Antiemetics like Compazine, Phenergan, Zofran, they can be helpful for those who are really not feeling well. And really, what you're trying to do to help get the, uh, the person back from his, his or her injury um, in the most efficient way possible is to keep the symptoms at a minimum. And if they're not causing their own symptoms, you can help along with these things. Trigger point injections can be helpful. I don't see them really that acutely. Usually, I try to give them a few days of some, some rest time. But if, for example, the greater occipital nerve in the back of the head um, can give radiating pain across the top of the head, if you can block that um, and maybe put some dexamethasone or um, methylpred or any whatever into that same area, you might be able to block it enough to cause a relaxation of that headache. Um, research is really, really lacking. There's very, there's very little in the research. And the biggest reason, I think, is that um, this, this problem is so vague from one or different from one person to the next. So, so there isn't a cookbook like we have for a fracture management or diabetes management. You know, there's a, there's a recipe book where you can kind of follow this path or that path. This is, this is a much more difficult bowl of soup to go through. Um, most of the research that's out there really lacks a lot of the things that we need, like double-blinded uh, double blinded protocols or randomization of patients. And um, we see that the research that's out there also includes more, those with more severe injuries and extrapolation from more severe to less severe in practical application isn't always really relevant. Um, we also have to remember that each type of treatment that we're doing goes with that first oath of Hippocrates. We don't want to create harm while we're trying to 
trying to treat. And none of the medications that we have in, in the armoire for this is really um, without a potential for side effects. Um, and they're not really on label. And that goes for, actually, for all of them except for maybe the analgesics. Um, again, in terms of the subacute management, I tried it. There's no book on how long you wait. I think arbitrarily, at least for me and probably for, for the two of you, and you probably try to give them the window of opportunity as much as possible to, for that first week to 10 days or two, two weeks to see what happens with the symptoms to resolve before you start bringing out a lot of medications or other treatments, I would think. Um, if you, you have to balance subjectively how heavy these symptoms are impacting that person's day-to-day -day life um, because you have to benefit, balance your benefits against your risks. And you should know what you're doing with the medicines, of course. Don't be, don't be uncomfortable with them and, and wing it. Um, there is no medicine that speeds up the recovery. You can slow down recovery by continuing to stress your brain cognitively or physically, but you cannot really speed up the recovery on the other side. At least there's nothing that, in research that supports that. Um, and because, we're, because these injuries are variable, so is the pr approach to dealing with them. I, look, I like to look at it this way. You, when you're dealing with a person who has more of a chronic injury and is taking time to recover, um, all of the different types of things we're going to go through in this set of slides um, has to do with its kind of its own entity. So, for example, the post-concussive person with chronic headaches would probably merit similar treatment as someone who has chronic headaches and never had a head injury. Or depression, same thing. You know, just try to tease out the problem, separ separate it from the thought that it's post-concussive, even though you're framing that in the context of your conversation with the patient, and that's how you would try to deal with it. Um, if we can divide them out, we can divide them into a few different categories, emotional, um, physical symptoms, problems with sleep, cognitive deficiencies or, or impairments, um, and make sure that we really know ahead of time that what is going on with the person beforehand. If you have some familiarity, it really helps. The person who has depression coming in or has, you know, is on, you know, Lexapro or something for depression and comes in with a head injury may have a different set of problems post-concussively than one who does not. Or, so, and I'll get into some of the other stuff as we go. In looking at the first category of sleep disturbance, um, really before you start getting into trying to medicate sleep, I think you need to talk about sleep hygiene, particularly in teenagers. We all know, we have teenagers or we've been them, that they don't like to go to bed at the same time every night. It could be up in the middle of the night. We talk about taking away their, com their computers, iPads, texting, and that in the middle of the night. And sometimes a friend will wake up at 2 in the morning and say, oh, I need to text so-and-so and say hello. And so they don't really get good sleep because it's interrupted for other reasons. So it's, it's really wise to take a first approach of you go to bed at 10 o'clock or whatever time you set, and then you get up at this time and take everything out of the room. Leave it alone. Make sure the room is dark. You know, and, and take away things that might be stimulating. You know, for adults who smoke or use tobacco or nicotine in some way, or, or kids who use monster drinks or any of those other things, caffeine and nicotine are neurostimulants and may interfere with your ability to sleep. And they don't stay in your system just for a few hours. They actually can, uh, nicotine and caffeine can actually, uh, or lipophilic and can linger for a while, a while. And what you have in the morning or for a few days in a row may bother you the next night. Uh, melatonin actually has had some study in its help. Um, it's a hormone that's produced in the pineal gland um, from serotonin. And we know that it has a higher level of in your circulation during sleeping hours. So it's postulated that it may help with, with sleep. We use it for people who, where we, people use it to try to recover um, or, or deal with jet lag for long, long plane trips. Um, it's not very toxic. I do want to caution that if you have a pregnant person, don't use it because there, is, there are some concerns of pregnancy and, and um, melatonin. Um, but the research is really limited to mice. You bop a mouse in the head and then you give them melatonin and you compare them to the ones that you bopped and didn't give them, it seems like it has some protective effect. Um, and it may be something related to antioxidant effects. But that's really, really very, very primitive research. Not, not a whole lot is, is, has followed this. 
uh, yet. Trazodone, um, long time, long known antidepressants, uh, sleep medication, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, used a lot in this more severe brain, brain injury folks. I don't see very many of the severe brain injuries, so I don't have a lot of experience with that, that category of people. But I have not really used this in my um, chronic sleep deprived post concussive folks. I, I, that's not where I usually go. Um, sometimes it's mentioned by, by others in the field as a first line choice. Um, and it does make sense because it does work for those who have insomnia. Tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, nortriptyline, benzodiazepines, um, Zolpidem, and other newer ones like um, Lunesta and uh, Sonata, they're around that they can be helpful. I, again, this is better to be used, I think, in this category than in the acute phase where you're trying to determine is a neurological status change because of something you did or because of something inherent to the injury. Um, there are other non-pharmacologic methods of managing sleep, including um, phototherapy, which means changing your light or having a fixed light and day, uh, night and day schedule. We do this a lot in the northern part of the world when we have uh, cabin fever. People who have seasonal affective disorder, they can go through that. Chronotherapy is a way of trying to enforce a sleep habit. Like I mentioned earlier, you go to bed, what time you usually go to bed? Well, I go to bed at midnight. Well, okay, maybe for a couple of nights you go to bed at midnight, but you're getting up at 8 o'clock or whatever time it is. Then the next two nights you're going to go to bed at 11.30, and you get up at 7.30 or and you just work your way back to more of a, a routine. Um, and that sometimes it helps. Um, next category would be headaches. This is probably the most common one that you're going to see in someone who has a post-concussive syndrome. Um, it, it's often difficult to treat. Um, we use anti-inflammatories and analgesics often for these things. And we do them without the advice of physicians or for the patient a lot. And they can be inherent risk. There can be inherent risks with that. Um, we have to watch for rebound. Rebound is a very common effect that we see from uh, using analgesics um, on a frequent basis for headaches or for other reasons. You may have somebody with arthritis that you're managing with any. It doesn't have to be ibuprofen or Tylenol. It could be Celebrex or Meloxicam or any of those other things. But over a period of time with constant use, you can induce headaches. So you just have to watch for that. And again, if you tease the, tease the headaches apart by what the international um, system for classification of headaches, then you can direct your treatment. Again, you're not treating post-concussion syndrome. Think of it as I'm treating chronic headaches to help the post-concussive patient feel better or get better. Most of the headaches that you're going to see, by the way, on that are tension or migraine type. They're not going to be um, some of the other cluster type headaches you don't usually happen in the post-concussive patient, although that can, can occur. Um, for the chronic management, this is the one that I, this is the category that I will use the most. Um, it's probably the most commonly cited, and that's a tricyclic uh, antidepressant use. That's amitriptyline, nortriptyline. Um, they are at least moderately successful, um, can be used for management or prevention of both migraine and tension headaches. They can also help with sleep. They're very sedating, so you may be hitting two birds with one stone. Um, other things that are used for the management of headaches, beta blockers, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like nifedipine, and it's any of the peens, um, Depakote, uh, topiramate is Topamax, Neurontin, um, dihydroergotamine. I've never really used dihydroergotamine. I've been in practice for 17 years, so I don't um, venture in that, but it is something that is reported. Um, Non-medical things that you can do, biofeedback, physical therapy. Sometimes headaches can be caused by vestibular dysfunction, and treating the vestibular or balance dysfunction may, may help resolve some of the headache problems. Um, but these are also the therapies that, and again, that are not used just because you had a head injury. These are used because you have a headache. Um, these are also trying to tease apart after this is over, after you think the concussion is over, if someone didn't have a headache history prior to the injury but now has headaches, are we dealing with somebody who's got a post-concussion syndrome? Or are we having a lingering recovery thing? Or what are we dealing with? That's a, that's a very difficult thing to tease out. So um, it might not be a bad idea to, 
to invest in consulting with someone who works with these types of problems if you're not comfortable with that. But it makes it for a very difficult play, return to play decision for anybody. Um, next category in somatic symptoms would be dizziness. These are, this is a very vague word. It can mean anything from I feel like I'm going to faint to the world is spinning around me and I can't walk a straight line if I, if I was, uh, my life depended upon it. Um, sometimes you can get an objective finding like a positive Romberg or um, like an otolith problem like um, Dix Hallpike might tell you if there's an inner ear uh, cannula stone. Um, the best testing is, again, for the balance problems like we would see with Romberg. Um, we try not to deal with vertigo with medication if it's chronic because most of the, if you can't identify it as something coming from the inner ear, for example, if you treat with meclizine, you blunt the symptoms, sure, you may feel better for the moment, but you actually don't give yourself an the patient an opportunity to get adapted to the symptom and then get through it. Um, so I, but if you have to go there because it's a very profound symptom in the short term, meclizine is the, one, is the medicine of choice. Benzodiazepines can be used. Again, I always I keep throwing out the caveat of watch for the neurological symptoms. You don't really know in the in acute phase. In the, in the later phases, you're not going to be really worried. The first window or the first 72 hours is the window of potential danger, the most potential danger after a closed head trauma. Um, but when they, when they come to me, before we can consider any type of pharmacologic management of, of dizziness issues, at least for me, I'm going to be sending that person to vestibular therapy. And vestibular physical therapists are very, very useful. There are not very many around, um, and they can make a lot of difference in, in, in taking somebody who has a problem, whether it's a gait disturbance from, from uh, the inner ear problem all the way through to post-concussive vertigo. In one of our cases, we're going to talk about that today. Depression is another common post-concussive thing. We don't really, there is no magic time frame after which we, we know this is coming from concussion. Now, to give you an interesting story to kind of go along with this, I have a 17-year-old high school student who when he was a freshman had not one but two severe concussions within a week of each other. And the first one, he, he looked dazed and confused. I wasn't at, attending to the event at all. His parents were there. He, he looked off, but he wasn't taken off the field. He reported the symptoms to his trainer who told him he had a headache and the neck strain and made him continue to go out. And then he went back to play and this next week he got hit hard again. Had a very long recovery two years ago. This spring, he'd been actually in the last year and a half or so, he'd been fine. This spring, um, he, he came back and was playing with some friends. He was sitting on a, sh a small crate and uh, playing with a ball and he kind of fell over backwards accidentally and not very far, you know, you're talking maybe eight, 16 inches or, or so, hits the back of his head, has another concussion symptom type thing. Right now he's getting psychotherapy because he has gone totally upside down mentally, taking it out on his parents, really totally different kid, depressed. It's very difficult. And so, but, but it happened very immediately to the, the second injury. So that's to illustrate kind of something short term, but long term you hear about it in the news all the time about how the former foot, well, football's in the news. The former football players are now depressed. Well, how long have they really been there? We don't know. Um, it is a very common symptom. It, it could be direct in the short term because I'm not playing anymore. Coach, I feel fine. Doc, I feel great. Why can't you let me back on the field? This really sucks. I can't text. This, this championship game means the world to me. And that can be a, a, a short-term depression. Or, or I can't get my homework done. Why can't you let me do my homework? Um, you, you try to work with them best you can with coping. Don't really try to work with them too much on managing with medication in the short term. As it gets to be longer term, then you can start working with, with medications. And the standard medications we use for regular depression are the ones we use for here. The uh, ser I'm sorry, sertraline or, or, or Zoloft has been studied in traumatic brain injury in more severe cases, and they've seen some things that have improved, like psychomotor speed, uh, memory and cognitive efficiency um, have been seen. Um, it's not where I usually go. I usually start with amitriptyline because most of my post-concussive folks will have headaches and sleep problems, so I'm trying to attack all things at the same time. But any of these are, are effective and worthwhile to try if you're comfortable with them. Um, maybe 
maybe amitriptyline doesn't have the best data for MTBI depression, but I would argue that in my experience, I have pretty good success with it. So it's not always just what's in the literature that's lacking. Um, citalopram or Celexa and fluoxetine or Prozac have also been studied. They're potentially helpful. Again, no conclusive data yet. Um, cognitive symptoms. Uh, these includes trouble with, this includes trouble with memory, concentration, speed of processing information. We can do this with, at the very early onset we, if we identify these issues through computerized cognitive testing or informal neuropsych testing. We can get on top of them early and hopefully head them off before they become a chronic issue. Um, cognitive rehab is not really necessary usually acutely, but those who have prolonged troubles with it you can assess that, and that's through the help of someone like Summer um, to help direct us in that, in the, the, the right uh, place for that. Um, medications are really not necessarily prudent um, because most cases recover fairly predictably well. If they're prolonged, um, then we consider treatment. What is prolonged? Nobody can tell you. Methylphenidate or um, Ritalin has been studied. Um, there is some suggestion of benefit in some randomized trials that uh, this may help pick up attentional deficits and processing speed just like we would see in ADD. With more traumatic brain injury, it, uh, it can be more, a little bit riskier because it lowers your seizure threshold. I'll try to say that five times fast. Um, amantadine um, originally came out in 1969, um, or before 1969 it was um, found to be helpful in Parkinsonism in the late 60s. And, and um, it was, of course, we know it as an anti-influenza medication. Um, it's dopaminergic, neuroexcitatory. Um, there are several studies out, and, st and some of them come out of Pittsburgh, where some are trained, um, showing efficacy in improving processing speed and executive functioning. Um, it's not, the data is not overwhelmingly convincing, but it is, it is another piece in the puzzle that you can use to help pick someone up who may be cognitively a little bit slow beyond the point where you think they should be. So someone, in my book, someone arbitrarily within two to three weeks doesn't seem to be picking up that cognitive speed um, like you would hope, um, and everything else is being followed correctly, this might be something worth trying. It is safe in pediatric patients, so you know you can go there with them. Um, others that are tried but not with any proof are Dinepazil or Aricep, we use that for Alzheimer's, Prozac, um, Zoloft and a number of other things. Um, so uh, I appreciate your attention. That was a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to go over, but um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Rand and talk about what we do, what we're looking for in the future. Okay, there. I, the thing I want to come across with here is the treatment of concussions is in its infancy. Uh, two years ago, nobody talked about medicines for concussions. Uh, everything was about the diagnosis. Uh, it's only been in the last couple of years that we've really started to talk about medicines for that. Um, the, but remember, most people get better in three weeks. Uh, very few people that we see in clinic uh, will return to play within a week, and telling your football coaches that they're not going to get better in the next couple of days is an important thing to do. The things that are seen as risk factors for re long recovery are gender, genetics, previous history of migraines, pre previous history of depression or anxiety, or previous attention deficit or learning disabilities, okay? Gender, Summer talked about this, genetics. There's an ApoE protein, there's an ApoE4 allele that has been shown to be a marker for prolonged recovery. So in the future, there may be a genetic test that not, doesn't necessarily say you're gonna get concussed, but may put you in a different risk pool. And at some point, we may try to track people to different sports based on that, okay? Okay, migraines, if it's, it's difficult. Remember the migraines, the headaches that come with concussion are very much migraine. So the previous headache that they have, if, it, if they've had migraines in the past, it's very hard to sort that out, okay? Pre-existing psychological disorders we'll see all the time. And there's a guy named Jeff Kutcher from uh, Mi Michigan State. Uh, he was a neurologist at lectures about this. And he says that very commonly, uh, concussions uncover a pre-existing thing that was subclinical in the past. So uh, PTSD, depression are very common post-concussion. There's a postulated connection between the neural, neuronal dysfunction that happens in this frontal part of the brain. Uh, but remember, it may have been there before, but not been a problem, but it's just now there because the brain's not able to suppress those problems uh, once it's injured, okay? 
ADHD and learning disabilities are very common. We know that the, the issues that happen in the front of the brain that go along with attention deficit are also the ones that are damaged with, uh, with concussions. And the things we see cognitively for people who are concussed are very, t very similar to what we see in people who have attention deficit. Okay? Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is the CT is what you hear about all the time. Uh, this guy named Omalu who has been doing the brain study, uh, looking at um, autopsied uh, NFL players and other athletes who have had problems. Very commonly, you'll see these tau proteins depositive, and it looks just like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the the concern is the changes that happen with recurrent concussions can lead to those problems. Now. I don't know what's going to happen with that for sure because chronology doesn't always equal causality. And remember when you were in medical school and when, you were, when I was first in residency, it was malpractice to not put a postmenopausal woman on estrogen. And I was dinged for that all the time. So well, we've learned that that's not necessarily the case. We don't know what's going to happen with this. But as more is understood, there's more, there's more things that are going to be done for treatment. There's a lot of testing that's we're starting to look at and a lot of things that are done on concussions. You can't see it on a regular MRI, but functional MRI so shows glucose changes. PET scans can be used. There's biomarkers for injury in the CSF and there may be some in the blood and it wouldn't be great to get a blood test for, con for concussion. You could get a finger stick on the sideline to help you make that decision. I don't think that's ever gonna happen, but that'd be great. Okay, there's more need for more research on the pharmacologic management like Dr. Braunreiter was saying. Unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff out there in the the recovery is variable, so it's going to be very hard to de design a study that really shows that we made a difference. Uh, helmet technology changes all the time, but remember, just wrapping the egg in a, a big soft bag and then banging it at something at 100 miles an hour, the egg's still going to break. Okay? People look at accelerometers and look at the g-forces that are uh, that are associated with concussion also isn't that reliable because it g-forces haven't been necessarily the only thing shown to cause that it is the sudden stop and the sloshing around of the brain inside the skull okay all right remember the good old days nope okay so in summary, the proper diagnosis and management is essential. Individualized approach to your concussions. Athletes should return to play follow conservative approaches. This is not your father's concussion. Educate athletes on concussion and tell them that this is a big deal. No athlete should ever get the, the, the message that this is an injury that they ought to be able to suck up. Okay? Neurocognitive assessment is important. Now we're going to talk some about Natasha's law. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so really quickly, I want to go over this. Um, at the end of the presentation, we're, we would definitely want to leave time for Theron to do a case. Um, if we don't get the questions in like we wanted, please see us afterward. I'd really like to spend some time if you have some questions. This is a pretty important topic. Many of you may be serving on concussion oversight teams now or are the physician that's a team physician making these decisions and signing these things. Um, there's been a lot of paperwork done now with um, this law. Natasha, who it's named after, was a high school athlete who played soccer who had multiple concussions. I met her when I testified before the House Committee on this bill and I also um, worked alongside her when I served on the panel to create the verbiage for this law. So I'm pretty versed in what it entails. There's a lot of myths and misconceptions. Hopefully we'll um, combat some of those for you today. Um, essentially though, um, this bill requires and it applies to all UIL governed sports. So it does not apply to club sports and it does not apply to private schools. So if someone gets injured in club though, they still have to follow this protocol if they play in the high school. So it doesn't matter where the injury occurred, if there's still a known concussion and they play high school sports, they still have to go through under UIL the protocol. Um, then for the next component, um, basically a concussion occurs, we've already talked about that you have to be removed regardless, um, be assessed if a concussion is deemed to have occurred, even within question, um, when, in when in doubt, set them out, they have to be removed. Um, then they have to see a physician and physician is defined in the bill as a medical doctor and the physician must say um, whether a diagnosis of concussion has occurred and or they must release the athlete when appropriate to start the return to play protocol. Now the return to play protocol um, is, can differ by school districts. So essentially the concussion oversight team is a group of individuals who we'll go into in just a minute, but the, the district will then, based on that concussion oversight team recommendation, will have a protocol in place. So some of the um, 
difficulties that have arose with the law is that school districts have differed in their return to play policy. So there's some variability. There are some schools, the Mesquite protocol has an athlete have to be symptom free for seven straight days before they can start the protocol. Whereas in other um, school districts, they may be employing the, the 24 to 48 hour asymptomatic rule. Uh, UIL goes at a minimum and says it needs to be 24 hours asymptomatic before starting this protocol. So there's some differences there on, on how they will be different. Um, the concussion oversight team, this has also somewhat um, caused a lot of concern because people don't really understand what all this entails. And what it was meant to, to be was a panel of people the school district recognized that had um, components such as an athletic trainer who has to be on the team if they're employed by the school district, a physician, uh, it has to, it can include if possible a neuropsychologist, a physician's assistant, and a advanced practice nurse. So it may not just be your school nurse, they have to be a nurse practitioner or nurse anesthesiologist. They fall in that advanced practice nurse component. Administrators, coaches, your principal, the school board member cannot serve on the concussion oversight team. So they put the protocol in place. The athlete does not have to see any member of that concussion oversight team unless that is the protocol. Um, so you are able to take your child to the physician of their choice. Now one particular school district, Klein ISD, the athlete, the protocol says, must see a concussion specialist or someone who has um, basically identified themselves as a concussion expert. So they can't just see a pediatrician, it has to be somebody that has proven they have this, this background. Um, the now, many times you need to find out if you're on a concussion oversight team. I've learned I'm on many of them, and I don't even, I've not seen their protocol. So you need to kind of ask the schools that you're working with, make sure you're comfortable with that concussion oversight team protocol that's in place, because you may not have seen it. Um, at minimum, the return to play protocol, um, if you adopt the UIL, which is, a, again, a minimum, it's, it's kind of set to where an athlete could be back in next Friday's game if they were injured the Friday before. Um, that's rare, though. Many of them will not become asymptomatic within 24 to 48 hours. Um, but most concussion oversight teams may have employed things that are more restrictive, like I just mentioned. Um, when we talk about um, compliance, um, Essentially, we want these protocols overseen by an athletic trainer. We know that we're not at luxury to have athletic trainers in every school district, particularly in our junior highs, um, whom are also um, part of this, this bill. They are the ones represented as well. Um, a coach could oversee that return to play protocol, but they cannot make the decisions in terms of return to play or when that's appropriate. Now, you will receive your credits today, so yay for everyone in this room that you've sufficed your two hours by September of 1st of 2012. However, the recommendations for um, CE credits is kind of also contra controversial. Everyone on that concussion oversight team, with the exception of the physician, has to have CE credits. The physician, it's only recommended. Now, the other thing that's been sort of a disadvantage with this bill and people are coming forward and kind of complaining about is when the athlete goes and sees someone, a, a pediatrician, um, primary care physician, uh, team physician, um, those individuals don't necessarily have to have CE credits or training in concussion management. So the argument is people are seeing folks that are clearing them to return to play that have A, maybe no idea about the law, and secondly, have any concussion training in their background. Um, so lots of education is, is supposed to occur with this as well, and, and when a concussion occurs, there's lots of paperwork now for any of you that have been filling out all those forms, but athletic trainers are burdened with a great deal of paperwork, getting signatures from the physicians that are treating the athlete, and, and also um, getting signatures in terms of them returning back to play properly. Um, as we talked about um, the, the protocol, when a concussion is um, suspected, there has to be a signed uh, diagnosis made by a physician. Some schools will not take an ER uh, physician as being that person that's diagnosed it. Um, some will. Again, that's it's also a lot of variability, but there has to be a diagnosis made, and the first step is really that once they become symptom-free, that athlete has been cleared by the treating physician. The language must say can start the return to play protocol, and the protocol being about a four to five day progression, um, which would include, as we've talked about before, the different steps, um, you know, mild, moderate, heavy exertion, and then contact. At the conclusion of that return to play protocol, another signature will occur where the physician says, you know, the best of my knowledge, the athlete has completed the return to play protocol. I am now releasing that athlete to game play. So some of the other controversy has been now there's multiple doctor visits. 
Although I think many of us, because we work so closely with our athletic trainers, we're often, at least if we're seeing them once, we're, we're trusting that, that pr progression to occur. If someone has symptoms along the way, of course, that would um, halt the, the return to play protocol, we stop the protocol, let them become asymptomatic, and then start at the uh, opportunity at which they didn't have symptoms. So we, we kind of back them up in the plan. So these are just the phases. We went over them previously. Um, they're in your handout. Um, but this is the, the UIL, essentially. Um, but again, some, some school districts will say you need to spend two days at every phase. So that's just depending on what your school district's uh, caught, the COT, the concussion oversight team has uh, came up with. Um, Theron, if you want to come on up and do your case, and we'll um, get Larry to put that up here for us. Uh, my name is Theron Enns. I'm the head athletic trainer with the Houston Dynamo soccer team here in Houston, Texas. And uh, I'm going to give you a case study today of a unique situation that we dealt with last year with a concussed athlete. Um, so this athlete was a 28-year-old uh, uh, professional soccer player. He was injured uh, during preseason with a previous team. Uh, we'll have a, a later discussion over coaches trading for injured players uh, on the side if you guys want to talk about medical staffs not being listened to by coaches. Uh, the mechanism of injury in this, if you're familiar with soccer, a crossing and finishing drill. Ball is served from the sideline into the penalty box. The forward's job is to head it into the goal. This player attempted to head the ball. Lateral rotation was actually struck on the right side near the temple forehead. Uh, and he immediately noted that there was something wrong, but he returned to the drill without saying anything to the medical staff. Attempted a couple more headers and was unable to continue. He was evaluated by the athletic trainer on site. There was no loss of consciousness. There was no retrograde or anterograde amnesia, no headache, but he again said he didn't feel right. Again, sometimes the athletes can't express what it is, but they just know they don't feel right. So he was removed. Um, his description of being struck by a brick, not a ball, uh, definitely was uh, something of note by the athletic trainer at the time. No previously reported or diagnosed concussions, although through many of the subsequent interviews and discussions that we had with him, we did uh, determine that he did, may have had one concussion that was unreported and undiagnosed in college. Said he felt off for a couple days, difficulty concentrating on his finals. But again, we're seeing a lot of athletes, they don't remember previous incidents since there wasn't a heightened awareness of concussions in years past. So when he was removed, he was given the, the modified SCAT-2. We have a, a version in Major League Soccer that's just slightly different, but anything that you find online is very good. Those symptom scores uh, are what we use on a daily basis to monitor our athletes. Those scores range from a zero, don't have that symptom, to six, which is severe. The majority of his symptoms from the first day until the day he was cleared ranged in the one to two category. So those are, those are low, not even moderate by most standards. So that was a very unique thing. He was initially sat down for a week, uh, spent some time traveling with the team, noted that uh, air travel was difficult for him, uh, increased his symptoms, had difficulty with bright lights, i.e. being outside at practice watching his teammates, uh, and was having difficulty uh, concentrating with uh, issues of television, texting, video games. Just because they're, they're grown men, they, they still play those video games up until their 20s and 30s, so we have to take them out of those things as well. He was then seen by the team internist. Uh, regular MRI was normal, referred to the neuropsych per our protocol. His, uh, the initial was, impression was a vestibular concussion because of the balance issues that he was uh, reporting. He was sent for uh, evaluation by a physical therapist, a uh, neurologic uh, physical therapy clinic, uh, noted that his vestibular deficits were the exertional dizziness, mild balance deficits, motion sensitivity, and mild visual stabilization deficit. He began uh, structured physical therapy there with his previous team three times a week, or three times a week for a couple weeks, and then he was traded to Houston. When he arrived, we needed to get a, an idea of what we were dealing with, and so he was evaluated by uh, Dr. Brownrider and Dr. Ott to give us uh, kind of a new baseline, so to speak, or our introduction to this athlete. Uh, we concurred with the previous diagnosis. Everything seemed to be on par. We were told at the time by his previous medical staff, three, four more weeks of you know, physical therapy, he should be fine. Um, we then began a process where we started to record the symptoms only from the SCAT-2, uh, we have a 24 uh, symptom list. I think it's 22 on the standard SCAT. And uh, that was monitored on a 
fairly regular basis. It was not a daily basis because he was not in attendance on a daily basis with the team. He was often at physical therapy seeing the, uh, the vestibular rehab. So part of that included a uh, Neurocom evaluation. If you're not familiar with the Neurocom, that's the machine down here in the corner. It uh, presents a, a way to test their vestibular system by removing some of the visual and uh, balance issues. It's a pretty intensive program and pretty uh, expensive machine, but uh, a lot of uh, neurologic, uh, neurological rehab facilities will have that. Um, so that noted that he had some uh, difficulties in unilateral stance, and uh, he also had a right eye convergence insufficiency with the nystagmus. That caused us to uh, refer him to a neural ophthalmologist to have that evaluated to see what we were dealing with there. Again, at my level, we kind of chase after every symptom. We have to throw everything that we have at it versus maybe at the high school level where the parents don't have all the money in the world or the best insurance. I'm fortunate that we have, I won't call it unlimited resources, but we're not the NFL yet, but uh, we did uh, try and chase down every symptom and make sure that we were getting everything that we could for this athlete. So this was his, uh, his test that he had here with Dr. Ott. You can see that the only differences here were in the, the visual memory composite. Again, most of his scores from his baseline over to his injury, there were not great deficit problems that, we, that were noticed, um, noticed on this testing. Very sensitive, this was the only issue that came up. So Dr. Ott's evaluation, Dr. Brownreiner's evaluation, he seemed fairly mild, not, didn't seem like it was gonna be a long-term type issue, but uh, we soon found out that that was not the case. So the neural ophthalmologist, she had diagnosed him with a light sensitivity, one of the symptoms he was continuing to report, the right eye convergence insufficiency. So she prescribed him with some tinted contact lenses, uh, which were great, except he couldn't tell the difference in the colored bibs uh, for people that practice, so we knew that was gonna be a problem if that continued when he returned to play. Uh, he was also given some home exercises with a computer where he was tracking with the eyes, and that seemed to uh, start to correct the, the visual problem that he was experiencing. However, over the course of three more months of continued physical therapy, um, he was still not progressing uh, with the balance issues. He was using the Neurocom on a regular basis, as well as a lot of uh, manual techniques and uh, repositioning techniques with the physical therapist. The athlete described some frustration and obviously some anxiety. You know, athletes, they read the paper and they hear the news. You know, it's been previously discussed some of the the athletes who are retiring, they're now aware of everything that everybody else is going through. So that kind of added to his anxiety in this situation. We went ahead and had the neurologist review the case to make sure that everything was okay, and he recommended a referral to an ENT. Uh, the neurologic exam, the review of the MRI, everything was normal there. When he was sent to the ENT, he, was, he referred uh, the athlete for EMG testing. You can see, once again, most of his testing was all normal. He did have some borderline low or low on the, the VEMPs. Uh, they ordered a CT scan to make sure that there wasn't anything wrong through the temporal region, which came back normal. Um, so basically, he, they again referred him out to a, a different therapist, this time an occupational therapist, to do a little bit of uh, evaluation and treatment for the, uh, the inner ear balance issue that they believed he was still dealing with. So the occupational therapy, uh, they do a battery of tests, uh, wearing the goggles, the visual testing, the positioning tests. Essentially, the, the repositioning mover, maneuvers is where we ended up uh, finding some success with this athlete. So the occupational therapist would see him once a week, plus gave him some home exercises. I'll show you these, uh, an example of these in the next slide. He noticed that the, the balance issues were beginning to decrease uh, on a fairly rapid rate. And so he was able to uh, increase his activity with us where he would begin the return to play protocol now that the symptoms were dropping down to zeros and ones. And then he was able to use the repositioning maneuvers on his own when he got dizziness from activity. So he would come into us and he would try a 15 minute jog and he'd say, okay, I'm a little dizzy after that. He would then do his uh, repositioning exercises, predominantly the ones here on the right hand side were what he would do on his own at home. You're basically positioning your head to get the cannulas lined up. And, and again, I'm not the expert in this, but I'll just give you the brief summary. 45 degree rotation of the head, aligning the cannulas in a, in a vertical position, rapid change of position, and then you could also turn the head the opposite way and then reposition it as well. And this, this was a technique that he could use himself and at this point, three, four months into the process, he was just ecstatic that there was something he could actually do as an athlete to get better. 
because unlike traditional rehab where they can work their butt off doing exercises or cardio or something that they are actually physically participating in, the frustration of concussion injuries make it very difficult for athletes to feel like they're getting anywhere and making any progress. So I'll go back real quick. Uh, towards the bottom here, you'll see the, uh, the symptom scores dropped to ones and zeros by late July, early August as he was progressing in his return to play. I know the protocols say that you need to be all zeros, but at this point when he was a one, we, we consider that a tremendous change and we felt like with the repositioning maneuvers, we could actually mitigate that and continue along the return to play protocol. So a little variance, and this is where sometimes the skill and the interaction between the multidisciplinary approach comes in handy that you, you can tweak things a little bit, discover what works for the athlete and move forward from there. Again, the on-field return to play, you have to remember this athlete now was, he had participated in three, four weeks of preseason and then was sitting around, unable to jog, ride a bike, walk long distances. So now we had a deconditioned athlete that we were dealing with. So we basically had a really long return to play protocol. This wasn't every 24 hours he took a, a large step. This was, it would take him a week of 15, 20 minutes running where he was exhausted. So it took us quite some time to get him the, the return to play on the field. So again, you go through all the things that were highlighted before, the initial cardio, higher level fitness. For us and, and for any sport, this, this is one thing I'd like to note is working with your athletic trainers or a knowledgeable coach, you can integrate sports specific activities. And that's very important because in soccer, we head the ball. So that as a concussion rehab, that's an important thing to get to at the later stages once they've determined that everything else is working. So we brought him along this protocol, working with the ball at his feet, light toss headers. I mean, that's like a five foot difference, very lightly tossed. And then we would get to the point where somebody would kick him a ball and he would head it. Um, we also have the ability as a neutral player, kind of like a, I guess a pink shirt quarterback, nobody's gonna touch him. So he would get in the middle of the drills and he would be uh, involved, but there was no contact and eventually unrestricted play. Um, there are some good resources out there. Uh, this is an article that I use a lot, um, the Johnson uh, et al. Uh, from 2004. That also includes some ice hockey stuff. I know that's not huge in Texas, but um, it's got some good return to play protocol details in there. The athlete did request uh, protective headgear. Uh, a quick note on that, that is very controversial in soccer. Uh, some people say that it's not uh, necessary and that it's not helpful. Uh, I viewed it much like you might view a knee sleeve for a person who's coming off of meniscus surgery. If it makes them feel more comfortable and it's doing no harm, I'm okay with it. And in this case, the athlete wasn't running around sticking his head in thinking he had a football helmet on and he couldn't get another concussion. It just gave him that little bit of confidence that he could return to the field and begin heading the ball. He, by the way, still continues to wear this now almost a year later. So <clears throat> now we're into August, we're six months post the injury. Uh, all the symptoms returned to zero, resumed full unlimited training, and his first game back for us was uh, August 17th where he played 10 minutes as a substitute. Followed that up a couple days later with a reserve game uh, for 90 minutes, and then he finished with nine appearances and four starts, including uh, our final game uh, in the championship last year. So. He's currently symptom-free and fully participating, although, like I said, he still does wear his, the helmet for uh, comfort's sake. Um, I think that was it for our case study, and um, if you have any questions, I'm sure we'll get to that here shortly. And the question is, do you adjust um, medication dosages as you go along, or where do you start? I think it's always smart to start small and, and work your way up. The, the medicines like um, the antidepressants take a long time to really affect changes. So you're not, this is another reason why you don't want to um, start somebody in the first week or two with headache problems from a concussion to, with, with amitriptyline, for example, because it may take them you know, two weeks or a month and by that time it may already be over. But um, especially with the teens, I may start with the smallest dose, which is 10 and work my way up to 25, 50, and you just, it's a, it's a titra titration thing. I think what um, 
actually what has to occur is that first initial signature that, that you release them to start the protocol and at the conclusion they have to say that the, the athlete has completed the protocol successfully and now is released to full participation or gameplay. So there is two signatures required. Um, you know, again, it's kind of at an individual physician's recommendation whether or not you want to see that person back or you just are in communication the whole time with the athletic trainer, which I believe most of us, that's how we operate it for uncomplicated cases. Uh, the, the way I do it, I'm on four different cots, I guess, and the way we designed ours is I, well, I, I see them, release them to return, re release them to return, to start the return to play protocol. Uh, every day, the, the trainer and the athlete fill out their, their, symptomatic, their symptom questionnaire. Uh, the athlete and the trainer sign that when they've completed the non-contact the non part of that. Uh, they fax it to me, uh, I, re I review it, uh, and then I have a checkbox that says, may, ret may return to contact, or, and, and doesn't need a follow-up appointment, or does, I sign it, I send it back to them. That satisfies the need. That's as their, as their physician. The, the, the person on the, the concussion oversight team has no responsibility to clear the athletes. That's, that's an individual physician. But they've got to have a clearance from the physician when, they, uh, when they're released to contact. And, and that's absolutely up to you. If, and when I, if I have athletes that I'm more concerned about, I, I, I do see them back. And I have that op option on all of those athletes that I've seen to say, no, I've got to see them back before I return them to play. Uh, but this is one of those things that I do often enough and I see often enough, and I'm familiar with all the athletic trainers that I work with on these, uh, that I'm confident that they have returned, they have completed their protocol, There's, they've remained asymptomatic. Uh, and it becomes more efficient to allow them to go back to play. I don't think making them back, come back in for another visit to say, no, you're fine, uh, and let me do that and, and get another office visit from them, I don't think that adds to their care the majority of the time. But there are cases where I do want to see them back. I, I would also throw in on that that most of the time when we see these folks, you're probably going to be seeing them in a the follow-up visit because the first time they're symptomatic and the second time they won't be and then you're allowing them to go back. And if you have that good relationship with your athletic trainers or whoever you're working with, then that makes that part easy. Because that's just the test, that, the physical test that you're going through to make sure that everything is okay. You, hopefully you're, you're observing cognitive impairment as well as the physical stuff to make sure that everything is in order before you even give that release. And also to address the other component, you said the immunity is really in the law only for the concussion oversight team in the school district. So certainly that doesn't protect any issues that may occur as the treating physician. Yeah, at this point, um, no one's really looked at the impulse control itself by itself to predict anything in terms of recovery. Um, I think the this examples that I tended to show up there had high impulse control. On the whole, though, most of Clinically, even in the college population, I don't see that component as high unless they have a history of ADD or ADHD. But um, I just don't think that issue is, is really looked at so much in terms of recovery from concussion and or what, I think what you're alluding to is that make them more aggressive or um, produce other behaviors after concussion. Generally, what I feel like is they were probably present before what I see clinically and, and many times maybe the athlete coped with them or they weren't brought to the surface in a concussion, a head injury, then bringing those behaviors much more to the surface. And you certainly would want to know about that in your clinical interview so that you could address those after concussion. That might be their disposition afterward. Well, the concussion oversight team, just to clarify, and this is, is certainly brought a lot of questions, really it's there just to produce the protocol which the district should follow. And, and I can tell you from experience what's mostly happening um, is athletic trainers are developing that protocol and it's not like a, a set of individuals that are on the team are really coming up with that. And most of those concussion oversight teams are supposed to be approved, the, the individual members as well as the protocol itself by the school boards, and I don't think that's happening as well. So at this point, there's not a lot of policing being done, 
But, you know, again, just to clarify, an athlete does not have to see a member of that concussion oversight team. It's just merely put in place to adopt the policy. It, it does describe what a concussion is, and it, and it certainly says if any, you know, signs or symptoms or any suspicion that they have to be removed from play immediately, and at that point, I, I think it's really the physician who they go to's discretion is whether or not it's diagnosed as a concussion. Now, some physicians may say it is not a concussion, but the, the bill is kind of nice in a sense because there's checks and balances. At the very end, the athletic trainer really kind of gets the final say because a physician can clear an athlete, but if an athletic trainer can demonstrate that even going through that or at the end they don't feel like they're recovered from their concussion, that athletic trainer's duty essentially is to say or, or, or indicate that, you know, we're not going to, I don't feel comfortable clearing this athlete even though a physician's done that. So that can happen. That is not true, and that's the controversy. Um, now, the physician on the concussion oversight team, because there has to be a physician involved, it's recommended that they have two hours of CE training. Um, but yeah, so that's the, the point. Most people that are going to a pediatrician or someone, at least folks like you that work in sports, many of you have had this training in your past and are just familiar with it clinically. Pediatricians don't know about the law, and they don't know about it, so that's the point, and they don't have to have the training. So So let me ask a question to the audience. Has uh, anyone here ever cleared an athlete to go back after a concussion? You felt they were ready to go back and they've gone back and had a catastrophic injury or major uh, long-term sequelae? We sent this questionnaire, basically that same question, out to all the members of the TOA in preparation for this uh, symposium and uh, to get a sense of how well we as orthopedic surgeons are determining when athletes are ready to return. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the most, not the most scientific, but gives us some idea of how well we're doing. We had uh, 40 respondents uh, for uh, high school team physicians, and uh, the average number of years that they were high school team physicians was 13.9, uh, so almost 14 years. Average number of teams covered was 4.3. So you get that together, it's almost 2,400 team years of experience, of returning concussed athletes when the doctor thought it was safe. And out of that, only one incidence uh, of having a, a second significant injury uh, after they return to play or having some long-term issue. So it's a pretty low issue. The, the, the law is good because in the past, you know, if someone gets concussed, the trainer can be, you know, uh, let's face it, the athletic directors of most of these, uh, a lot of these high schools are, are the, is the head football coach. And uh, they make decisions as to who's the trainer and who's not the trainer. And so they've got some significant influence over, uh, or pressure over, over the trainers. So this interjects a physician into it. And uh, in the past, uh, players getting cleared without seeing a doctor, they were getting cleared by just seeing a chiropractor. Who, uh, who make themselves available to be team physicians for several high schools, uh, at least that I know of. So this in in ensures that the player at least is evaluated by an MD or a DO, uh, someone with a license to practice medicine, and take some of that pressure off the trainer. So uh, kind of help stand up to the, an overbearing coach uh, and, and make sure that the athlete is, is uh, ready to return uh, when when uh, we say there is, uh, but uh, it was it's remarkable that without all these tests, uh, just going by overall overall gestalt, so far uh, we've done a fairly good job, and uh, we should look at this law as a way of uh, ensuring that we stay involved uh, with these important decisions. Mm -hmm.